Kaifis Cain, the Emperor's Finest. Editorial note. This selection from the Cain archive is taken from a relatively brief, but far from uneventful period of Cain's life, when he was attached to the command staff, Brigade Headquarters, as an independent commissar. Reviewing the records of these half-dozen years, it's not hard to see why he arranged to be reassigned to regiment on active service at the earliest opportunity. As even this would have seemed relatively safe in comparison to some of the arrangements which had came his way. A consequence of his unwanted reputation for heroism, which he seems to have found both natural and inconvenient in the extreme. A reputation which, true to form, he continues to insist throughout the current extract of completely undeserved. Many of my readers have taken this claim at face value, and many others have constructed in that as regular engaging blindness to his own virtues. Having known him personally, I tend to view that the truth is a little more complicated than either plosidation. I have already dismantled several of his subsequent exploits with the Valhallen 597th, and see no need to replicate the circumstances of his finally getting his wish. Instead, I had chosen to concentrate on what may have been the pivotal incident of that period of his life, the consequences of which were reverberate the decades to come. With hindsight, too, we can discern the first faint breath of wind distend to become the storm which threatened to engulf the entire eastern arm of the turn of the millennium. I was also influenced by my choice of Merito by the reflection of this selection answers the number of questions raised and left open by some of the previous extracts I've edited and circulated among the fellow inquisitions and inquisitors alike. Not least of which is the nature of his connection to the Reclaimer's Astartes chapter and the circumstance surrounding his involvement with the ill-advised boarding of the Space Hulk's Spawn of Damnation. Since the details of this appointment as Imperial Guard, the station officer, to the chapter, and his eventful journey to meet them, have been convinced in one of the short extracts I've already dismantled. I've chosen not to repeat the mutual here, but to begin Kane's accounts of events with the Viridia campaign itself. As always, I've endeavored to clarify matters where appropriate by use of footnotes and the interpretation of additional information by hands. Especially where Kane's habit of contracting the relatively trivial incidents which affected him personally threatened to lose sight of the bigger picture. The bulk of what follows, however, is entourage Kane, and admistic as ever. Imbelini Vale, or Dozinos. Chapter 1 It's not often I'm happy to find myself heading into a war zone as fast as the warp currents can carry me, but in the case of Viridia campaign, I was prepared to make the exception. My journey there had been uneventful, or eventful, to say the least, having taken passage on the Adeptus Mechanicus transports heading in roughly the right direction. I found myself fleeing for my life through a Necron tomb world, which my host had been incontagious enough to start poking around en route. If it hadn't been for the fortunate arrival of the ship from the Reclaimer's Adeptus Astartes chapter, there would have been no survivors in the affair at all. As it was, I'd expect by the skin of my teeth. I escaped by the skin of my teeth and more luck than anyone has the right to expect. I don't suppose anyone would believe a word of it, though. So, I'll get on with my tale. I can prove, as I doubt anyone will ever get around to read these ramblings of mine. <laughs> it's all academic, of, in any case. I can't say I remember much about my first few days aboard the strike cruiser Revenant, but that's hardly surprising given the condition in which I boarded it. When I came to, 
I find myself in a Spartan sectorium, occupying a bed which seemed far too big for me. While faces I didn't recognize swarm in and out of the midst which seemed to be hovering just in front of my eyeballs. Kamazar, a voice which sounded impossibly deep, rich, and resonant, asked, Are you awake? For a moment I doubted that, still comfortably insulated from reality by the pharmaceutical cluttering up my bloodstream. To my drug addled mind, the voice sounded like that of the emperor himself, and I found myself wondering if I should have spent a bit more time in the temple and a bit less in the bars, gambling dens and uh, bordellos. But it seemed a little late to be worrying about that now. If I had indeed arrived at the Golden Throne, I just had to hope that the occupant was in good mood and try to steer the conversation on the safer ground of the earliest opportunity. Then one of my instinct faces swarm close, enough for me to focus on, and memory blatantly kicked in. I think so, I husked, vaguely surprised by how thin my voice sounded. For a moment, I wondered if it was due to disease or disuse, and feared I'd been unconscious for weeks. But my faculties began to trickle back. I realized that it simply sounded feeble in comparison to the one that had addressed me. Almost at once, memory followed, and I relieved my desperate dive through the Necron warp portal, and my arrival aboard their ship just in time to encounter a space marine boarding party. The metal creatures, I asked urgently, are they dead? A debatable point, one of the three giants surrounding me said, and smiled in a somewhat unsettling manner. The mechanical claw on which it looked as though it would have been more at home attached to the power loader hovered behind his shoulder in a manner of a tech priest mechadendritz. The one loomed over me, shot him a reapproving look, and turned back to the bed I was laying on. Though thinly padded, it seemed damnably hard for infirmary. You'll have to excuse Durban's sense of humor, Kamazar. It's not always appropriate. A hand as broad as a dinner plate slipped behind my shoulders and helped me to rise in a sitting position, bringing more of my surroundings into view. Gleaming metal surfaces, burnished like a drill sergeant's boots, were everywhere, making the place feel more like a mechanical shrine than a place of healing. It had been more perversive aroma of counterpieces and the icon of the emperor and his aspect of the great healer, gazing at me serenely from the wall opposite. I might never have realized I was in a sanctorium at all. Most of the equipment I expect to see in such a place was absent, perhaps tied it away in a featureless metal locker, ranged against the wall in what little more is still vibrant. Variable meant nothing to me. I'm apothecary scholar of the reclaimers, and in answer to you, your question, this vessel, theirs, was destroyed. Which didn't exactly answer the question, of course, but it sounded good enough to me at the time. Knowing what I know now about the Necrons, I wouldn't have been bothered to ask, but it was the first time I encountered them. Don't forget, these days I wouldn't count them out if the entire planet they were standing on had been raised. Caiaphas Cain, I said, inclining my head decorously and immediately wishing I hadn't. I believe I'm your new Imperial Guard Lazian officer. That's my understanding, too, the third giant said, speaking for the first time. Like the others, he was dressed in ceramite armor of the dull off-white color with yellow gauntlets. Although his was inlaid with the great detail more augmentation than the suits of those comrades. He bowed his head. Captain Gariz, commanding of the Viridian Explanatory Force, it appears your reputation is less exaggerated than we believed. Indeed, the tech marine scholar had introduced, as Durman said, his mechanical claw flexing slightly as he spoke. Few men 
could have escaped unscathed from a Necron tomb world. Uh, hardly unscathed, I said, suddenly remembering two of my fingers being ripped away by a glancing shot from a metal killer's hideous weapon. Nerving myself for the sight, I lifted my right hand into view and found myself staring at a formless bundle of bandages, so blotted with padding that no shape hinting at whatever they might conceal would be discerned, as if being reminded of his existence had flicked a switch. I suddenly found my entire hand itching. The augments are knitting in well, scholars heard me, as if I had the faintest idea what he was talking about before I could even ask him. Duraman cut in again. You alone survived, he said, when scores of your fellow perished. Two figures seemed a small price to pay. If you put it like that, I said, I am forced to agree, and I didn't even notice that they'd gone until I was waving goodbye to the creatures in the tunnel. The jest was feeble enough, I'll admit, but I was hardly at my best under the circumstances, and in did the job, which was to convince my listeners that I was modest about my so-called heroism. Time and again, I found the more I appeared to be trying to play down my unmerited reputation, the more people seemed to believe it. Dunman seemed surprised by my flippancy, but agreed it would be so. His broad face seemed with a faint treachery of a scar tissue, widened for an instant with a barely perceptible smile before returning to its precious immobility. Grise didn't react at all, but returned to the point at which, though no one else had even spoken, with a single mindedness of a servitor attempting to follow a simple act of instructions. I would like a full report on your experience on Intiridus Prime at your earliest convenience, he said. Technically, I suppose, I could have told him to keep his thinly veiled orders to himself, as the only people I answered to were the commissariat, but that would hardly have been polite or politic. I was going to have to work with him, or the people who reported to him, for quite some time, and putting his back up before... We'd officially begun wouldn't exactly help matters. Besides, I've come to I've come up with something for General Lucas and his staff back at the brigade headquarters to explain how I've managed to mislay an entire starship and since both it and the expedition had carried and belonged to the Adeptus Mechanicus, I was pretty sure they'd be taking a keen interest in whatever I might have to say too. There certainly didn't seem any harm in letting the captain of the reclaimers have a copy as well. The wider I could spread my version of events, the less likely it seemed that anyone would be able to gleam. I'd been somehow culpable, which, for once, I hadn't been. Just in the wrong place at the wrong time, and it seems to have happened inordinately often during my long and glorious career. So I simply nodded again and tried to ignore the firecrackers going off behind my eyes as a result of the incantatious movement. If someone could find me a slate, I'll get right on it, I said. It's not as if I've got much else to do while I'm here. <laughs> as job of make work do, relieving the night, uh, relieving in the nightmare I'd so recently been through was hardly the most congealu I might have chosen, but as I progressed, I found myself setting out the events with greater ease and more fluency, recalling them in greater detail than I expected. No doubt it helped that I had unexpected ally in the endeavor, Durman taking in upon himself to debrief me and making several visits to the quarters I'd been assigned on, leaving the sanatorium for the purpose. As I recounted my experiences, he would ask questions about the equipment the tech priests had been using to probe the ruins and such blasphemous artifacts as I remembered seeing in the depths of the tomb world. I had no illusions about the fact that his interest lay in whatever technological insights I was able to provide rather than my company. 
But as the voyage progressed, our conversation gradually widened to encompass other topics, and I couldn't deny that he was rather more convivial than the other Adeptus Astartes I had so far encountered. I wasn't the only unhenced human aboard, of course. In fact, the few dozen reclaimers were outnumbered three to four by one of the chapter serfs who crewed the vessel. I found these servants tedious company at best, however. Even more so than the Skitari I had met aboard the Armasaya's bounty. The reverence for the space marines they served seemed second only to devotion to the Emperor, unanisued to the society of anyone outside of the enclosed little world. They were claimed distinctly polite, rebuffing any attempt of conversation with formal and strictly functional responses. The one assigned to look after me, a youth named Gelidin, was efficient, unobservative, and unexceptionable. So much so that I found myself missing the presence of Jürgen more than I would have thought possible. True, my aid was a walking insult to the uniform of the Imperial Guardsmen who made the average orc seem fiducious and fragrant by comparison. But I guess I learned to trust his dogged loyalty, and he'd become an invaluable bulwark against the more enormous aspects of my job. After some consideration, I decided to leave him back at the Brigade Headquarters. However, partly because of the notion of Jürgen in close proximity to the finest warriors of the Imperium had ever produced made even my mind boggle. And partly because I got an inkling that Locus had me embarked for another assignment for the hero he fondly imagined me to be. And I wanted my aid in place to head it off with an unusual orbit refusal to debate from the protocol. The upshot of which the Dermon was the closest thing I had likely found to tolerable comparison or companion. Before we reached Viridia, I found myself looking forward to his occasional visits. On the last occasion he dropped by my quarters, he found me and turned into my handprint of my report with an ink stick, and a faint smile I'd seen a few times before drifted across his face. The new fingers appear to be satisfactory he said, a trace of pride entering his voice. They are indeed, I agreed, laying the tedious job aside with a sense of relief and flexing my newly acquainted augments. I still found their altered appearance a little disorienting, but they started to feel like part of my own body at least. I was able to grasp things again without looking to make sure I judged the distance correctly instead of over or under reaching by a millimeter or two. Dunamon, who transpired, had constructed them himself. Collaborating with Scholar on the installation, so it seemed I had a lot of stuff to thank for the tech marine for. I nodded at the pail of pipers. At least I got this finished before we left the warp. I added, The brother captain will be pleased, Dunamon said. As usual, he remained standing and seemed perfectly comfortable doing so. In my time with the reclaimers, I seldom vow that any of the Adeptus Astartes sitting down, and when I did, it was almost inevitably for some practical reason, such as driving or riding in the back of a rhino. There'll be little time for paperwork when we reach Viridia. <laughs> I suppose not, I agreed, pouring myself a much-needed measure of amesthetic. In actual fact, I was planning to do as much file shuffling as possible, in preference to visiting any of the battalions. But I wasn't about to admit that to one of the Emperor's finest. As things were to turn out, though, the insurrection had continued to grow while we'd been transitioning to the warp. And by the time we arrived, notions like fronts and rear areas had ceased to have any military meaning at all. The entire system was one huge cauldron, seething with conflict, and we were about to drop into the middle of it. Have you found time to analyze the strategic review? Dedemann asked, and I nodded towards the data slate on the deck beside me. I've skimmed it, I admitted, which was the best anyone could have hoped for, 
and a great deal better than I normally managed. And the briefing documents provided by the Minotaurum, usually I found far more pleasant ways of spending my time aboard the ship than wading through the triggered purpose of administrative drones whose conclusions would inevitably turn out to have been overtaken by the events while we were transitioning to the warp of any case. But the Revenant was conspicuously lacking in recreational opportunities. Pacifying Viridia looks simple enough. At the time, I of my comforts seemed more than justified. Rebellions in the backwater systems like this one tended to be sparked by grievances against the planetary government rather than the Imperium itself. And the arrival of a few guard regiments was usually enough to bring both sides to heel. So far as I could see, the situation hardly merited the deployment of the Astartes at all. And the reclaimers would undoubtedly have found better uses for their time, if it hadn't been for the fact that the Viridia system was a major supplier of food and raw materials for the hive worlds of the sector. Unless the flow of tithes was resorted in pretty short order, they'd begin to suffer socially and economically in turn, leading in a wave of instability which, left unchecked, would drag down dozens upon dozens of worlds within the decade. The manpower and resources required to deal with that would be uncalculable. I concur, Dunamon said, with the confidence I would have expected one from the Emperor's finest. And I must admit that I considered it more than justified. The average and suturated rabble would have lasted five minutes against a couple dozen guardsmen, let alone a genetically enhanced space marine. He might have been about to say more, but the familiar disorienting sensation of a starship slipping through the barrier separating the material universe from the warp swept over me at that point, leaving both of us dissentled and further into the conversations. I don't suppose I'll ever get used to that, I said, little knowing that the time how far and frequent my travels were to become, the ensuing years to the point where I was able to shrug off the lingering nausea almost at once on this occasion. However, I was more than grateful for the anesthetic. I had poured a few minutes before, and drained the goblet in a couple of swallows. I was just beginning to feel relatively normal again when the lights flickered and a faint tremor ran through the deck plates beneath my feet. Memories of my experience aboard the Hand of Vengeance a few years before sent my heart racing, and I was already reaching for my weapon then. After listening to the calm beat in his ear for a moment, Durman told me that they already decided for myself. We appear to be under attack, he said. Editorial note. Since, as usual, Kane only gives the most courtesy background to the events he's describing, he's, here seems to be a good place of any to resort a mere objective overview of the Vridia campaign at this point. He entered it. From the various of betrayal, the cleansing of Viridia and its aftermath by Lady Orlane Meroth. 958M41. It's undoubtedly fair to say that the first few months of what was to become a Viridian insurrection gave few clues as to the scope of the chaos and carnage to come. What had begun as a wave of popular protest against the mooted imposition of the 2% tax on increase in volative candles by the Emnesternum erupted into a violence in several provinces almost simultaneously, which in hindsight, of course, we can see how carefully events were orchestrated. From the moment of the agent of the conspiracy first slipped into conventional measure into the final projections of the following year, despite the protections of the planetary governor that he'd never seen the proposal, and certainly wouldn't have approved of it if he had. A large selection of population laid the blame for the squirrely at his door. Some even going so far as calling him Elec the Heretic, a nickname which the poor man remains saddled with even today, albeit now just in jest. With even today, albeit now in jest. How much of the ecclesiarchy pre 
pretendable accommodation of the so-called tax on piety was spontaneous, and how much of the result of inflation of the tanks, the ranks, we can only conjecture, but there was no denying the outrage with in which the average Viridian in the thoroughfare reacted. We've always been proud to call ourselves the Emperor's fearing folk in the prospect of being unable to afford the minimum and to maintain the tiny shares on which grace even the human of the humblest hovel, or to do so only at the expense of starvation and desolation and choice many of our poorer citizens would undoubtedly have made, was all but intolerable to the most of the polterists. And then Governor de Boyer pledged that the, he personally would make sure that the proposed legislation were never enacted. By the beginning of 928, the piety tax had become a rallying point of the machinations of all kind, of united only in their dislike of the planetary government. After their initial riots had been suppressed by the guards, backed up by elements from the planetary defense force, and only a few cases, the initial casualties among the civilian population became the focus of fresh resentment. And the wave of unrest associated with what seemed at the time to be astonishing rapiding, of which, in hindsight, it is clearly the result of careful coordination by the shadowy enemy, whose existence as yet no one even suspected. Verdi became all but ungovernable, and Governor de Bahia had left with no choice but to appeal to the Imperial Guard for help. Help was not slow in coming, but the distance between the stars and a vast one and many agonizing months were to pass before the vanguard of the relief force arrived in our system. To the joy and astonishment of the loyal Imperial citizens, the vessel was no Imperial Guard troop ship, but a battle barge of the Astartes bearing not only the matchless warriors of the Space Marines, but Kamazar Cain, the hero whose exploits against the orcish invaders of Pilia had inspired billions across the sector. As fate would have it, however, no sooner had the resentment re-entered the Manitorium than a treachery attacked. The anarchy which had been overwhelmed our home world, having spread to engulf the void stations and mining habs scattered throughout the system. Chapter 2 Having no better plan in mind, I followed him to the bridge. If necessary, I was prepared to argue that my position as Iliation officer made it my business to remain abreast of the unexpected developments. Although, to be honest, I just thought that would be the best place to find out what in Throne's name was going on. I've been involved in a fair number of space battles in my time, far more than any guardsman has the right to expect. In all too many of them, the only thing I could do was sit there and wait for the troop ship to make a hit. Or at least, on the bridge you can watch events unfolding in a hololith. Which introduces a curious kind of detachment into proceedings. As the contact icons go through the safety dance of life and death. In the event, however, no one challenged my right to be there. Which came as a welcome surprise. In fact, the only thing that surprised me more was that until Dillerman arrived. There was no Astartes on the bridge at all. Tech Marine, the vessel's captain, who for some reason rejoiced in the title of shipmaster, vacated his control throne and inclined his head respectfully, not something the Navy would appreciate, having the man in charge abandoning his duty for the sake of protocol in the middle of battle. But the Space Marine chapters, as I already began beginning to grasp, had a different perspective on things. Quite how different, I wouldn't fully understand for a few more decades, however. Carry on, shipmaster, Dermon acknowledged. The greeting of a barely predictable nod of his own, and the shipmaster resumed his seat. 
absorbed again at once in the flurry of information blizzarding across his pink screen. One of the control sections ranged about and hushed in dimly lit chamber, by which the muted chanting of the chords and incense from the tech adepts servicing the targeting systems drifted, remained vacant. And as the towering figure of the tech marine took his place before it, I realized that it was placed higher than the others. While a standing man more than two meters tall could work at it comfortably, the other lecterns were manned by chapter serfs in uniforms similar to those of the Imperial Navy, although their insignia were different, no doubt reflecting their affiliation and status in some manner I could be bothered to inquire about in the moment. Um, what's happening? I asked, and Dunamon glanced briefly in my direction as though surprised to be reminded of my presence. His gauntlet's fingers continued to rattle the keys of the data lectern, a blizzard of images chanting too rapidly for me to assimilate, danced across his face reflecting from the display in front of him. We have sustained only minimal damage, he assured me, which came as a tremendous relief. The last time I had been aboard a vessel under fire, I ended up breathing a vacuum. Fortunately, for no more than a handful of seconds, although I had seemed a great deal longer to Yurton than I. Revenant was made of sterner stuff than the venerable troop ship in which I had delivered to me to Perilia. However, being designed to be capable of holding their own against a ship of the line, and the voices around me were reassuringly calm. Um, who from? I persist. And Dunnerman was irritated. Uh, he wasn't irritated at all. He was too polite to show it. By way of reply, he activated a nearby pick screen, and I found myself looking at the slightly blurred image of a system defense convict. Viridian Vessel, this is a strike cruiser revenant at the Reclaimer's chapter of the Adeptus Astartes, the shipmaster said, his voice clipped. Break off and surrender, or we'll be destroyed in the name of the Emperor. They are turning, one of the vessels said, his voice equally a matter of fact. Looks like another attack gun. Gunnery station, stand by, the shipmaster said and glanced at Duramont for approval. The tech marine nodded again. All weapon batteries charged and ready. He assured his crew, his voice carrying easily to every corner of the bridge. Fire when ready, shipmaster, the shipmaster said. His voice as calm as he had just ordered a mug of recaf. Wait for a positive lock. The second stretched. Unbearably, the image of the attacking vessel glowing ever larger on my screen until I expected to see reveling beams of energy lancing out from it with every heartbeat. Target acquired, another of the bridge crew said, seemingly equally relaxed. And I finally realized that it was Dermot's presence that which made them so dispossessionally efficient. Nobody wanted to be the one to let the crew down in front of their masters. So they were all doing it by the book. Instead of cutting corners and getting away to impulse proficiency, like the guard troopers I was used to heading so often did when the last bolt started flying. A moment later, the attacking Corvit broke apart in the steed head on the wind. As our starboard batteries tore the guts out of it, to leave a slowly dispenting cloud of debris drifting apart in the void. Who were they, though? I asked, not really expecting an answer, but the Auspex man answered me anyway. The IFF beacon tagged it with the Lady Helene, one of the local system defense boats. Then they ought to have been on our side, I said, beginning to feel that matters weren't going to be quite so simple after all. If part of the SDF had mutinied, then the chances were that the substantial population of the 
Ken parts of the PDF had followed suit, or more likely led by example. Acknowledged, Dunran rambled, and for a moment I thought he responded to my comment before I realized he'd probably been too busy listening to the voice in his combi to have even heard it. I will inform the commissar. Inform me of what? I asked, already more half convinced that I didn't want to know. His first words were enough to tell me I was right about that. The situation has disoriented significantly, he said. The commendable restraint. According to our signal intercepts, a state of civil war now exists throughout the system. Fracking great, I said, seeing little need to refrain myself under the circumstances. Does Captain Grizz have any suggestions for dealing with it? I had got to know Duraman well enough by now to be fairly confident that the expression which ghosted across his face was one of faint surprise that I'd even bothered to ask. Intervene at once, he said, then broke off to listen to the voice in his earpiece. He is embarking in the hangar deck as we speak and extends an invitation for you to join him. Not least to say, an invitation I would even consider refusing. I was there, there lies the proclaimers. Command staff, which basically meant Grise. So, wherever he went, I had to go too. At least until the Pale Guard forces turned up. And I could find some plausible excuse to go and bother them instead. I'd be delighted, I said, hoping I sounded as though I meant it. I'd arrive aboard the Revenant by teleporter. I had been unconscious at the time into the barge, and so this was my first sight of the warship's hangar bay. My immediate impression as I walked through the airtight hatch, which slid closest behind me, with a square of metal against metal, was one of purpose, full activity. The inevitable crowd of the chapter serfs was bistering around under the supervision of the handful whose hearing and demeanor beckoned higher rank than their fellows, even though the iconography of their inf uniforms continued to be strange to me. A startling member of them had visible augments, which either indicated a fair degree of hazard in their occupation, even by standards of serving aboard a warship, with a kind of willingness to voluntarily adapt whatever enhancements would assist their work. I previously encountered only among the Adeptus Mechanicus. I suspected the latter, as I'd gathered from the Scitari aboard the Amasaya's bounty, and some kind of pact existed between the Reclaimers and the Ocolites of the Machine God. But there was no time to think about that now. Grise and his entourage were clearly visible in the distance, towering over the surrounding crewmen, and I set off across the echoing metal plain between us as quickly as possible. Like every hangar I had been in, the chambers was vast, and very scale of it curiously comforting. For the first time since coming aboard, I felt a measure of relief from the nagging sense of strangeness I'd experienced everywhere else aboard the vessel whose corridors and hatchways had been designed to accommodate a greater than human bulk of space marines, and left me feeling curiously shrunken, unlike the docking bays I'd passed through while embarking and departing from troop ships, however. The vast space felt clinically efficient. All the apparatus required to the few and rearm pair of Thunderhawks currently occupying it was neatly stowed, and there was a marked absence of cargo pellets and other dinners cluttering up in the space. The Thunderhawks were impressive enough, too, and I slowed my pace a little as I neared the closer of them. They weren't as large as the platoon-sized droop jump ships that the guard routinely used, let alone the company-sized behemoths I'd ridden in on occasion. But their blocky solidity looked immediately reassuring, and heavy armor could doubtless soak up lots of incoming fire. And they seemed more than capable of dishing out, as well as taking it. Judging by the amount of ordnance I could see hanging off the airframes, 
They were painted yellow and white, like the armor of the Astartes marching up the boarding ship ramp. Of one was approaching the, their simultaneous footfalls, echoing off the metal mesh like drum beats, and looked as fresh as if they'd been rolled out of the first time. Having gathered a little of how much tradition meant to the Space Marine chapter, I had no doubt that they were considerably more valuable than they appeared. Perhaps even centuries old. But the immaculate condition has tribute to German and the surf engineers he supervised. It heartened me too, I have to admit, as I found it hard to convince of any enemy capable of standing against such a formidable vessel. I trotted up to the ramp in the wake of the power-armored gongs, giants ahead of me, and found myself in the passenger compartment, constructed of the same cyclopean lines of everything else sized for Astartes. Only about half the seats were occupied, and I scrambled into one of the empty ones, feeling oddly like a child in an adult armchair as I fumbled with the catch rib. My feet hung awkwardly above the deck plates, and I was unable to draw the webbing quite right, as I would have wished. But at least I had room for my chainsword without having to remove it from my belt, as would have been the case aboard the Imperial Guard landing barge. Come as on! Greaves' helmet turned in my direction, easy to identify as it had rightfully augmentation with his armor and supermounted by a crest of green and black. Are you prepared? By the Emperor's grace, I replied, falling back on one of the stock responses which I generally use to avoid committing myself, and feeling it wouldn't hurt to look a bit more pious than usual surrounded by so many pedagons. There were fifteen of them in all. Grise commanded a squad, which I was pleased to see included scholar, is Nathesium ready to for use on the left Vanbrantz, and ten technical troopers, already broken down into two combat squads, almost carried bolters, which I was more used to seeing mounted on armored vehicles as easy as a guardsman handle his lasgun. While two other comrades were equipped with heavy weapons, it would have been taking the team of ordinary troopers to use efficiently on the battlefield. One carried a missile launcher, several reloads pouched on his waist, while another casually hefted the first man portable last cannon I'd ever seen with a gun mount. The face plates of their helmets were all the same, yellow as their gauntlets, although the captain shone with a leisure of gliding, gilding rather than pigment. May he watch over all of us. Grease intoned in response, although, to my surprise, he made the cogwheel gesture, a generally associated with members of the Adeptus Mechanicus, rather than the sign of the Kida. I didn't have much time to think about that, though, because the boarding ramp was retracting, and the engines fired up to a pinch, which left my ears ringing. It must have been fine for the space marines whose heads were cocooned inside their helmets but it was distinctly uncomfortable for me. There was no point complaining about it, however, even if everyone could have heard me, if anyone could at all. So I pulled my cap down as far as I could go and quietly resolved to get a hold of some earplugs before I expected another lift in the Thunderhawk. Look in your locker to your left, the nearest reclaimer said. His words just about audible over the howling of the engines, even amplified by the Vox, built into his helmet. With some difficulty, I found his suggestion, since everything was laid out for far larger arms than mine, and discovered a comms headset with padded earpieces and the Vox mic on the stock. I donned it gratefully and found the noise almost instantly reduced to a level one, calm standard bearable. Thank you, I responded, feeling faintly foolish. This is our planetary objective, Grease said, activating a pick screen. It seemed someone on his left had been busy in the relatively short time since our arrival in the system, 
and had managed to gather a remarkable amount of information. Earlier this, the planetary capital currently being fought over by three of the major rebel factions. The lawless voices are dug in, and the Ministerium Concursa, the Cathedral Penicent, and the Mechanius Shrine at the Governor's Palace, no doubt hoping the rebels will whittle one another down for them. The landmarks he enacted flared green on the map. We'll deploy from this place, from the palace. If we can ensure the safety of the governor, then the emperor's rule should be swiftly restored. I found myself nodding in agreement. I was assuming the man was still alive, of course. If he wasn't, then all had been inconsiderable enough to expire without leaving a clear line of succession. The resulting confusion as conflicting climates brawled for the throne would probably make things ten times worse. I take it you have a good reason to believe he's still in charge, I said, more to show I was paying attention than anything else. Gree's helmet dipped in almost impractical acknowledgement. He made a picked fast, five hours ago, appealing for calm and promising retribution against all who continued to defy the Emperor's will. The rebels responded as one might expect. Shelling the palace, I asked, and the captain's helmet inclined again. Given the amount of damage the building has already sustained, we can infer that he managed to survive the latest bombardment with little difficulty. He adjusted the image on the pigskin, and the palace and its grounds rushed towards us, feeling the flame. Either the Revenant carried some of the most sophisticated long-range sensors I'd ever seen or come across, or Donovan had managed to gain access to the PDF's orbital net, because according to the timestamp in the corner image of the image of the screen, it was the current one. The place itself showed signs of extensive damage. The entire wing burned out, and rooflets but the rest of the structure was pocked with a stigma of heavy ordnance. The permanent walls, which had been designed for this such of contingency in mind, had evidently withstood several results already and had been stored up or straightened in a few places. Although to my relief, I couldn't see any actual breaches. The muddy wasteland separated the two when it presumably once been formal gardens, was crisscrossed with trenches and tracks of armored vehicles, several dozen of which, I could tell, had been parked around the palace. That was good news, if nothing else. It was meant that there was a substantial garrison of PDF loyalists to hide behind, if by inconceivable quirk of fate, I was to run out of space marines. Grease highlighted the open area between the trench line and the building, which common sense and experience told me that to be covered by implants weapons from at least two directions. This is our landing zone, he said. My team and the Commissar will present our compliments to the governor of Dampuya, while Sergeant Toyo's squad will move out at once to ensure the safety of the cathedral in the shrine of the Al Messiah. The sergeant who already picked out the, by virtue, of chain sword, scabbard at his hip, opposite of the holster of his pistol, made no visible sign of acknowledgement, but his voice responded at once. One combat squad should suffice for each objective. Mine will safeguard the shrine. Therein, the cathedral. What about the Thunderhawk? I asked, hoping for an answer. Hoping it would be something of the effect of it staying on the ground with its engines running in case we needed a rapid dust off. <laughs> but knowing this was extremely unlikely. Seek and destroy, Grease said, which made perfect sense. With the local loyalists dug in at four known enclaves, pretty much anything else that looked military would be range renegade units, attached to one of the uh, squabbling factions. 
And for a game for a circling gunship. Let the nibbles know we arrived. Give the amount of firepower I've seen boarding. That was hardly going to be difficult. I nodded in every outward sign of approval. Might as well start as we mean to go on. I agreed. Grease manipulated. The controls of the big screen again. The image changed to internal view, relayed from part of the fire control system. Judged by the targeting graphics, superimposed on it. We were still at high altitude, but unably within the atmosphere. As I watched transfix the smoking ruins of Phileas ruled over the horizon. And I found myself trying to pick out the landmarks Grease had highlighted during his briefing. The cathedral was the easiest, still dominating the quarter in which it stood, despite the trembled ruins of most of the spires. With that to ordinate me, I was soon able to pick out the blank sided slabs of the administratum. Ziggurat and the barnish steel cladding the Mercenius shrine. And the governor's play palace was another matter, however, less than the others, and still some distance away, surrounded by a cluster of lesser mansions and their grounds. Like the she-grocks with young, as we grew closer, it became evident that many were burnt out and all had been pillaged, in a manner which put me in mind of a mob violence rather than a battle damage. The pall of smoke cleared, and we skimmed over the outer wall of the palace grounds, too fast to be targeted by ground to air fair. The unturned faces of guards and besiegers alike, identical mask of astonishment. Abruptly, I found myself pressed hard against the crash webbing as the pilot kicked in the rotors, Killing our forward momentum, then my stomach seemed to float free in my body as we dropped towards the ground. It was just as well. Jürgen wasn't with me, I thought. He was prone to air sickness at the best of times. And this was hardly one of those. Without warning, an orc-sized boot seemed to kick me in the fundament, and the noise of the engines died back to almost deliberate levels. We were down. Prepare to disembark, Grease says, as the ramp began to drop, letting in the swirl of damp air, lightly scented by the burning vegetation from the heat of our landing thrusters. Toroskais's fire team deployed first, jogging down the ramp and securing it. I was pleased to see that they were taking nothing for granted. Even though we were supposed to be meeting allies after a moment, the sergeant assured us all was well. And Grease and his command squad followed, seeing no reason to delay any further, and convinced that if there were a tragedy afoot, there'd be no place to discover the fact them behind a solid wall of boulder carrying carcerite. I taltered after them, trying to look as imposing as I could, given that my head barely came up to the level of their pauldrons. As my boot soles hit the ground, clutching the little on the ashes of the baked mud that still soaked gently beneath the thunderhawk, I got a lungful of smoke and tried to suppress the reflex to cough. No one else was, and I didn't want to be the one to underestimate the dignity of the occasion. As Grease stepped off the bottom of the ramp, he paused for a moment, two of his companions at either side and the exact pace behind him. Taken briefly by surprise, I stopped too, just short of walking to the back of him, and level with the other four Astartes, complaining the line, and of course, completely invisible from the front. Welcome to Viridia, someone said. I shuffled sideways a little to get a better view. We were evidently expected as a declaration had come to meet us. Ceremonial troopers there, Grouty uniforms, looking rather the worse for wear by now. Who held their last guns like men who'd recently discovered exactly what they were for, and were ready to employ them at an instant. Surrounding a man in robes so ridiculously overoriented, 
There could be little doubt that as to who this was, even before he announced the fact that I'm Governor Daniel Ben Pupa. And to my astonishment, he went down on one knee. You honor us by your presence. Please rise, he says, the Vox system in the helmet, perhaps mercilessly purging any traces of surprise or amusement from his words. We have much to discuss and little time to waste on ceremony. He reached up, removing his helmet, and Tupupa relaxed visibly at the captain's face came into view. It wasn't exactly a hololith, consisting, as it did, mainly of augments and scar tissue, but it looked a great deal more friendly than a black visage of pited ceramite. I am Captain Grease, of the Reclaimers chapter. These are my battle brothers, and this... He turned, apparently surprised to find me so close to hand. Is Kamazar Kane, a Lysian with the Imperial Guard elements of the task force. Imperial Guard? Tempupa asked, standing up as he'd seen, he's, as he'd been bidden, and giving me my first proper look at him. He appeared to be in his early middle age, although I was too familiar with the nobility's fondness for juvenile treatments, even on a backwater world like this one, to put much faith in outward appearance. And running slightly, it's too fat. His eyes, however, were keen and looked at me appraisingly. I was not informed of their arrival. They are still in the warp, I told him, reflecting somewhat refusy that I could have saved myself a considerable amount of inconvenience if I delayed the departure to travel with them and whatever piece of gung-ho idiocy Lorcus had planning for me to drag me into then could hardly have turned out to be worse than the mental abominations I'd barely escaped with my life form on Intradus Prime. Emperor willing, they should be here within the week. In fact, they should be here within the next couple of days if the warp curds couldn't, hadn't shifted apparently since the last estimate I heard. But nothing to do with the realm of chaos itself is either certain and I prefer to uh, on the side of caution. I raised my little voice above the scream of the Thunderhawk's engines, which were powering up again now that Vidiston's team had disembarked behind us. But perhaps this isn't the best place to be discussing operational matters. Quite so, Grease agreed, his voice cutting through the din as though it were little more than murmuring of wind through the trees. Having come here to ensure your safety, it seems a little unwise to be talking where the enemy could deny us our objective with a lucky mortar round or a sniper's bullet. This didn't seem to have occurred to the governor, who, to his credit, seemed relatively unconcerned of the possibility. Nevertheless, he turned and led the way inside, his escort looking considerably relieved as they regained a little hard cover. Grise and his entourage followed, while I oscillated between two parties connected to both by ties of protocol, but probably parts of neither. As we reached the heavy wooden doors of the palace and passed inside, I glanced back at the Thunderhawk, which was rising from the ground like a raptor in search of prey. Beneath it, Tusk and Venom were leading their sections toward the perimeter wall in diverging directions, as each made for the gate closest to the objective. And I breathed a silent thanks to the throne that I'd be well under the cover of a serious shooting started. I had no doubt that the Astartes would make short work of any traitors standing between them and the targets. But the initial contact of, for both teams would be close enough for us to attract any collateral damage that might be going well. Perhaps the Thunderhawk could help clear the path for them. It circled lazily over our heads one final time, then roared away to find something to shoot at. Watching it go, I felt a faint sense of unease, reflecting that, for better or worse, 
I was now committed to the defense of the beachhead, with nowhere to go unless it was through the enemy. Then reason kicked in and reassured me that I was to be safe here as anywhere in Viridia. After all, the palace hadn't fallen yet. It had now been reinforced by five of the most formidable fighters of the Imperium. Plus me. But should be able to avoid trouble here. <laughs> Surely. Chapter 3 De Pupa and his bodyguard led us through the palace at a rapid pace, down carpeted corridors, lined with tapestries and through wooden floored galleries, whose polished surface fared badly under the heavy stride of the space marines. The rich, warm sheen of generations of waxing, scuffing, and splintering wherever they set foot. The death-masked face of the governor's ancestor stared down disapprovingly from the walls as the casual vandalism, although Te Pupa didn't seem to mind much for even notice. After all, the damage was slight enough compared to the destruction, devastation, the rebel artillery had already wrought on his home. The Astartes seemed equally indifferent, walking in the same synchronized fashion I'd noticed before among their comrades, each left foot striking the floor at exactly the same time, then the right, with precision of servitors. Every time they took a step, the floor shuddered under the combined impact, and with the shock of it traveling up my legs, to the point where I began to feel as though I was aboard some slightly unstable warcraft. Fortunately, the sensation was relatively short-lived, as before long the wooden floor gave way to bare rockrete. The walls were fully finished in the same material, and I realized we were now in the bunker beneath the palace itself. As we descended to the levels, I found my unease diminishing this hidden rebout. Had survived in mineral artillery bombardments, unscathed, and would undoubtedly continue to do so. It was, therefore, with something approaching a light heart that I stepped through a pair of reinforced blast doors, curtainly popped open by a brace of guards in the same comic opera uniforms as their compatriots, who at least had the grace to pull themselves into semblance of attention as we passed them, to find myself in a reasonably well-equipped command center. Dragging my attention from the solid buttresses and thick ceiling protecting us, I caught intermediate glimpses of pick screens and data lecterns between the towering figures and power armor, which blocked most of my view. But I could make out little until they fanned out, indicating that we reached the operational area at last. Governor, a middle-aged man in rather more practical uniform than the ones we'd seen so far, resembling standard Imperial Guard fatigues. Most styles in greys and mid-blues looked up from the hololith which dominated the center of the space. A fanatically flickering image of the city was being projected in it. Spattered with icons, I was fairly certain marked the positions of friendly and enemy troops. The Astartes are assaulting the enemy outside of the eastern northwestern gates. If he was surprised to see me or my companions, he gave no sign of the fact, merely nodding in preoccupied greeting in our direction, and I decided to like him. Whoever he was, either he was keeping his mind on business of defending our enclave, or he'd simply decided that he was damned if he was going to look impressed by us. A game I knew all too well, and always enjoyed playing myself. Grise nodded, no doubt being kept up to date with his men's progress by monitoring systems built into his armor, and I began to regret. Discarding the bulky headset I'd been wearing before he, we left the Thunderhawk. It had been heavy and awkward, true, but been having been designed for a head far larger than mine. But in the end, I would have gotten used to following the progress of the battle through the combed 
I eventually wore. And I find myself feeling cut off from events without it. A sensation no matter uh, no member of the commissariat ever feels comfortable with, particularly one as paranoid as I am. Well, I just have to make do with the holith to follow what was going on. They are the reclaimers, Captain confirmed. And proceeding to their objectives, resistance is light. From there I was standing, it looked like the enemy were throwing everything they could at the two combat squads. I suppose from Gree's point of view, having just offed home world of Necrons, a rabble of rebellious PDF troopers offered little more than a handy bit of target practice. Thank you, General. Tim Pupa discarded his robe with evident relief. Turning out to my surprise to be wearing a uniform similar to the officer who greeted him beneath it, but without the rank pins on the collar. That's better. He added the richy patent material to the nearest guard and smiled at me in the manner of a man imparting a confidence. Can't stand the blasted thing, he said. Makes me look like a sofa. I couldn't really argue with that, so I, I didn't try. Instead, I turned to the Hololith and addressed the general. You no doubt know who we are, I said. So I won't waste any time with introductions, especially since I don't have any clue who the three of Gris companions were in any case. With their helmets on, they all looked like a boot to me, and I doubted that removing them would have left me much the wiser. What are we looking at here? The dispositions of all the units are currently aware of, the man in blue and gray replied. Apparently just as happy to dispense with the formalities as I was. Blue for loyalists, yellow, green, and red for the different enemy factions. They've been gunning for one another as much as us, so we're happy to let them get on with it while we wait for the relief force to arrive. It has arrived, Greed reminded him, looming suddenly at my elbow and staring at the display with thoughtful expression on his face. These deployments make no sense. I looked at the display more carefully, trying to see what he meant. The red, yellow, and green icons were clustered around the blue enclaves, like scum around an outfill, each encircling whichever imperial ribbit fell in the sector of the city they controlled. One each, plus the palace which seemed to be on the cusp of their zones of influence, and which was bordered on the south and east by red, yellow to the north, and green to the west. You're right, I said after a moment. There were considerations of color along with their mutual borders, but they weren't contagious. This wasn't entirely unexpected, since the squabbling factions could need far more manpower to fortify an arbitrated line several kilometers long than any could conceivably be the bear. But the positions they had dug in at didn't seem particularly strategic, and several potential weak points had been left completely undefended. Grise reached for the control lectern, Muttering the litanies of ancient seers, who maintained their similar systems for the guards seemed to employ while fiddling with the knobs. He must have hit on the right ones because the three colors suddenly turned a uniform sickly purple, and the whole pattern fell into place. Throne on earth, I said, horrified. This whole city's a trap. Clearly, Gree said, as though it should have been obvious from the start which I suppose to him it may have well have been. Only the pupa looked confused. General Orton? He asked, which at last answered the lingering question for the fellow's name. What does he mean? He means we've been idiots, Orton replied, looking about as happy as anyone would be after just being struck by an uncomfortable realization. The infinite squabbling we'd been counting on to whittle them down was for us 
just for show. He sighed heavily. I will remain in my quarters until you can convene the court-martial. You'll do no such thing, I snapped. If this mess, rally is your fault, I'm damned if I'm going to let you weasel your way out of cleaning it up by jumping in front of a firing squad. Orton de Pupa gapped at me. And although the Astartes remain as impressive as ever, something about their attitude managed to convey a degree of surprise as well. Kamazar Kane is correct, Grease agreed. But this is no time to deprive ourselves of the most senior PDF officer. I nodded, following up on an unexpected show of support. Right now, we need your local knowledge. We can determine whose fault this is all at once. The rebels have been brought to heel. I am at your disposal, of course, Orton said, with something of the air of a spirejack, who just hopped casually over a vent in the hive skin, before glancing back and realizing it goes down to the slump. I'm afraid I still don't follow, Dempupa said, a trifle unapologetically, and Grease just at the Horolith with a yellow gauntlet hand. These troop dispositions make perfect sense if the rebels were attacking as a single unified force. They can defend the city from outside attack extremely effectively. The hammer of the movements of any Imperial assets attempting to deploy within it. The Imperial Guard landing would have to take place at the Atrodome, I added, pointing out the landing field on the outskirts of the Philidus where, in happier times, aircraft and orbital shuttles would arrive and depart. It's the only open area large enough to establish a beachhead. But once they're down, they'll be sitting waterfowl for coordinated bombardment from these basilisks and manticore units. Orita nodded. Which have been targeting one another up till now, or so we've been led to believe. They can be neutralized. Gris said calmly. Now we're aware of the scale of the deception. The stratagem will not succeed. Not while the rebels think we're still fooled anyway, I said, wondering how they managed to pull off such a huge piece of sleight of hand. The degree of coordination required to have been, must have been immense. Taxing the skills of even the experienced high command, let alone a rabble of disaffected militia. My palms were itching again, but this time no sudden flood of insight made sense of my nagging disquest. So I turned my mind to more immediate concerns. The trouble is, the moment we make a move to take out those positions, they'll realize we're onto them. My assessment as well, Grease agreed. Redirecting our combat squads would reveal our intention at once as the enemy will certainly be aware of their intended dissections by now. He studied the holoth again. The manticore battery is close to the line of advance. We could take to relieve the defenders of the Administratorium Cloister. However, if my battle brothers and I make a third sally, the rebels should assume it'd be our objective until it's too late. Which only leaves the Basculus. I agreed, unable to fault his logic. Can the Thunderhawk take them out? Orison added. I shook my head. I doubt it, I told him. I served with the artillery unit, and they're always prepared for an aerial attack. The minute it appears in the Auspex, the Basculus will scatter. We've got some, but there's no guarantee enough they wouldn't survive to mount an effective bombardment on the Irodom. Then you'll just have to sneak up on them, won't you? A new voice cut in. I turned to find myself facing a young woman in even more absurd version of the elaborate uniform most of the troopers in the bunker were wearing. A crimson fabric was fashioned with silver braid, and the regimental crest was worked into epaulets in gold thread, which glittered under the luminators almost as brightly as the buttons on her tunic the top couple of which had been left undone to expose a 
generous helping of cleavage. <clears throat> the whole ensemble had clearly come to a courier rather than a quartermaster. And the last pistol holstered at her waist looked functional, even if it nothing else did. Kamazar, honored of Deptis Astartes, my daughter, Mira, De Pupa said. Although the resemblance was so strong, I'd deduced that before myself. Mira de Pupa had obviously inherited her father's build, although so far the genetic tendency to chubbiness had got no further than a hint of lush ripeness around the face, and imparting a well-filled out look of her tunic and trouser seat, <clears throat> which I would certainly have taken time to appreciate under more relaxed circumstances. Her hair was blonde and elaborately teased, green eyes gazing in our direction, as though somehow faintly disappointed not to find us more entertaining. That might be a little easier said than done, I replied, addressing her directly in a tone which, although formally polite, managed to convey the unspoken suffix, so run along and leave the soldiering to the professionals. Unfortunately, Mira, and as I was soon to discover, wouldn't recognize a hint if it was presented to her gift-wrapped, with the label saying, hint around its neck only if you're stupid enough to stay on the surface where they could see you coming she said dismissively and went to stand next to her father who was beginning to look distinctly uncomfortable i couldn't say i blamed him either he was obviously had much better idea who we were and what we represented to my surprise though oriton was nodding thoughtfully you mean to go underground? he asked, and Mira echoed the gesture. Of course I do, she said, scorn and self-confidence mingling in her voice. In a manner I was beginning to find quite irksome. We spent enough time booby-trapping the surface tunnels to stop the rebels getting in, didn't we? Why can't your people get out the same way? It sounds plausible, I said having spent enough time running around the undercities of various worlds to be well aware of the sprawling nature of infrastructure, almost certainly underprinting Fidelius. Are there any maps that we can consult down there? There should be, Orton said, and went off to converse with a nearby aide. I turned to Grease. I've been down service tunnels before, I said and they tend to be a bit on the cramp side. I tried to picture him and his men squeezing through the conduits I used to play in as a child, and failed to dismantle. Perhaps you better stick with your original proposal and leave the basculus to the local strike. Indeed, Grease agreed. A two-pronged assault underground and overground would seem to be our best strategy. Once our forces are committed, the combat squads that the Thunderhawk can divert to back us up. Sounds good, I agreed. Then we can begin as soon as you've selected a team to accompany you, Dree said. And I realized too late that I backed myself into. It goes without saying I'd never intended to lead the assault on the Basilisk in person. But knowing what Gries believed in me, which was essentially that that May inflated reputation was justified. I could blatantly see why he'd make that assumption of. Of course, now I couldn't back out without alienating the Adeptus Astartes I was supposed to be listening with. The undermining of my authority in front of the governor, so I just had to make the best of it. At least, I thought, things couldn't get any much more worse. I'll take care of that. Mira said, butting in again, with all the casual arrogance of rich brat born to rule the planet. She nodded coolly at the Astartes captain. We'll be ready to move in about half an hour. In the event, it was closer to an hour before the PDF were able to get themselves organized 
by which time we received an encouraging news that both combat squad had reached their objectives without taking any casualties. And that is Prowling Thunderhawk had got the rebels stirred up like a stick in an ant's nest, at which point I found myself in a thoroughly unwelcome conversation with the governor's daughter, who seemed unable to grasp the idea that anyone else's authority could exceed her own. I'm sorry, my lady, I said, exhausting all my diplomatic skills I possessed to suppress the impulse to say something far more direct. But I could not in all conscience permit you to accompany us. Mia looked at me with a sort of expression I could imagine she normally reserved for the lady's maid, who'd run her bath at the wrong temperature. I'm leading the expedition she said tirelessly. Live with it. It's you continuing to live, all of which concerns me, I said, deciding that suddenly was clearly wasted on her. The bountiful is no place for a civilian, especially if her presence was liable to put me in any danger, which hers certainly would. The governor's daughter drew herself up to full height, which was roughly level with my chin, while still somehow contriving to look down at her nose at me. I happen to be colonel-in-chief of the household regiment, she said, waving a hand in general direction of her appointment, which was jutting determinately in my direction. Or, can't you recognize a military uniform when you see one? As a rule, I said, biting back my obvious rejoinder about her garnish costume, but the title of Colonel-in-Chief is generally considered an honorary one. A faint blush began to spread across her cheeks, followed by a plantarate frown. No doubt the sensation of her not getting her own way without question was unwelcome novelty. How much actual military training have you done? I asked. My usual duties don't leave time for that sort of thing, the girl admittedly admitted reluctantly. But I've been out on the walls a few times. She hefted the last gun she picked up from somewhere, with more confidence than I normally expect to see in a civilian, and I had to concede she handled it as though she knew what she was doing. And I've been using guns on hunting trips since I was a child in very few of which I imagined the game shot back. I replied sarcastically. I turned to Dabupa, who was hovering nearby with a squad of troopers who escorted him to meet the Thunderhawk. Despite the ridiculous set get-up, they all looked as though they could handle themselves well enough, which was no more than I could have expected. On most worlds, the household troops guarded the governor tend to be the cream of the PDF, or was at least the curd left behind the other god types been met. I'd have a lot happier undertaking this fool's errand with proper guardsmen to hide behind, but at least this would be the best available. The majority were keeping their expressions steadily neutral, but a few were making no secret of how much they were enjoying the spectacle of their colonel-in-chief meeting unexpected resistance. Can't you talk some sense into her? Not often, dear pupa admitted, sounding almost proud of the fact. And her rank might be honorary, as you say, but she does take it seriously. After all, it makes her the most senior officer in the regiment. Fine, I said, greatly cheered by the realization that, in that case, I could legitimately shoot her if she got too annoying. But we are running out of time to debate this. Reason as Astartes had already left the command bunker and would be halfway to the gate by now. If we are going to be in position before the enemy realized their artillery batteries were the reclaimer's real objective and be ready to launch our own assault at the same time, we'd have to get moving. Otherwise, We'd arrive to find our target on high alert instead of having the advantage of surprise. Then stop wasting it, Mira said. She turned and gestured to the troopers, 
most of whom were carrying satchel charges in addition to their usual weapons. Move out! Stay where you are! I snapped, freezing the squad's first shuffle of movement to instant immobility. I turned back to Mira with my most intimidating commissario expression on my face. You're staying behind. Live with it. As I'd anticipated, having her own words thrown back at her didn't go down all that well. Correct me if I'm wrong, Kamazar, she replied, pronouncing my title in tones of which would have frozen Helium. But I was under the impression that your position is purely an advisory one, outside the normal chain of command. Technically, that's the case, I admitted, masking my sudden unease. But our advice is generally heeded by officers receiving it. Because if it isn't, we're entitled to shoot them, which inclines them to listen. Then consider me advised, Mira said, turning to beckon the soldiers once more. Move out! Well, I could, I could hardly gun her down in front of her father and hope to continue a productive working relationship. And there seemed to be every possibility that the enemy would do the job for me in any case. So, I simply shrugged with it. And what I hoped looked like a casual indifference... Dutely noted, Colonel. I sighed dryly. Chapter 4 At first, to my carefully concealed surprise, things seemed to be going well after all. Too naive or ignorant to appreciate the dangers of taking point, Mira led from the front, which clearly sat well with the troopers accompanying us striding confidently through the echoing underground labyrinth, as though we were simply out for a stroll rather than heading deeper into enemy territory with every step. That was fine with me. Apart from the Caligian spectacle she presented from that angle, she was certain to draw the fire from the enemies who might be lurking down here, or trigger any booby traps that they might have set. In good time to warn the rest of us. Entering the warren of tunnels and had turned out to be surprisingly easy. Simply a matter of dropping through the access hatch set in the floor of the corridor near the palace kitchens. And I'd straightened up after flexing my knees to absorb the impact of landing. I'd immediately felt more comfortable than at any time since my arrival in Viridia. Accompanied by absurdly dressed fire magnet or not, this was an environment I felt at home in. All my old and Hiver's instincts flooded back. I glanced around, noting with approval the burnt-off stubs of metal on the wall, which had once supported a ladder leading to the hatchway overhead. Orderton had assured me that all possible precautions had been taken to safeguard the palace and its irvins from enemy infiltration, sort of collapsing the tunnels completely with demo charges, which would have prevented Dempupa from fleeing if the palace fell to the besieging rebels. It was therefore unthinkable. And I was pleased to see that he appeared to be right about that. Apart from the regrettable tendency to believe intelligence assessments without seeking too many questions, he seemed to be competent enough, and I felt a certain amount of satisfaction with my judgment about leaving him alive and in charge appeared to be sound. Abruptly, we were plunged into darkness as the trapdoor above us was dropped back into place, and I felt my other senses reaching out, as they always did, to absorb the light. A faint current of air against my face provided a sense of direction and overlapping echoes of bootsteps against the crete pinpointed the walls nicely. Close your eyes for a moment, I advised. It'll help them to adjust. Or we could just kindle the illuminators, Mira said, suiting the action to the wood. A sudden flare of light made me squint, and a couple of the troopers followed her lead, 
filling the narrow corridor with dancing beams which struck highlights from the pipes and cable rooms fixed to the walls and depending from the ceiling. At least she had the sense to attach the thing to the bayonet lungs of her last gun, leaving both hands free to handle the weapon, and the others weren't too slow to do the same. Good idea, Colonel, I said, with heavy sarcasm. And how about a rising chorus of soldiers of the throne while we're about it, so the enemy can hear us coming as well? You're the one who said we're running out of time, she rejoined, turning to lead the way to the big, brisk jog, which did interesting things to her overfilled uniform. We won't get anywhere stumbling along in the dark. Reluctant to admit that she had a point, I contented myself with hanging back enough to take advantage of the shadows in the confronting certainty that my black greatcoat would be almost perfect camouflage in the dark, practically against an enemy still dazed after gunning down Mira. After a few hundred meters, which by estimate puts us more or less beneath the outer wall, I was able to see the reason for her confidence. The corridor up ahead was blocked by a flesh rock crate wall, onto which a narrow iron door had been set, which wide enough for one man to pass through at a time. Mira stopped just ahead of it and slapped her palm down on the scanner plate of the gene code radar, which had evidently been wired into the locking plate by a tech priest with rather more pressing concerns than doing a neat job. The device buzzed and hummed itself for a moment, giving me time to catch up with her, and the latch clicked, and the door swung outwards. Unbelievably, I was the only one covering it. How do you know the enemy aren't just waiting on the other side? I asked, nettling her smirk as she paused on the threshold to look back at me. Because none of the mines have gone off, she answered. Better hurry. They'll be set again in thirty seconds. Then she was gone, tilting off into the darkness beyond, her troopers pelting through the doorway in her wake. I followed the door booming back into place at my back, content to see that my relatively dim light from her illuminator, and picked up my pace when she saw she hadn't been exaggerating about the mines. There was a big cluster of frag chargers fixed to the walls, ceiling, and curved castings designed to spread their deadly payload. In the open, they'd be lethal enough, but in a space as confined as this, they're quite simply shred anyone Inten instantaneous enough to uh, approach them into a bloody mist. I picked up the pace until I was sure I was past beyond the range of the lethal devices, hearing them rearm with a faint click. A second or two after I was through the choke point and suppressed a shudder. Any more little surprises like that one? I asked, keeping my voice steadily, nonetheless. None will have to worry about, Mira assured me. In my experience, statements like that are a tempting fate. And sure enough, before the day was out, we were to be presented with a surprise greater and more deadly than either of us could possibly have imagined. But since I was still in blissful ignorance, I turned and followed her, instead of running the opposite directions, as hard as I could. Another hour or so of brisk walking got us to our destination, according to the map Oroton had provided, and which I immediately loaded into my slate. It wasn't most direct route, but it did avoid having to pass through any choke points, where we'd have to crawl, climb, or navigate obstacles, which Mira had neither the build nor the temperament to deal with, since I didn't think we'd lost any imprintable time by the detour, which had taken us through uh, the usual collections of utility ducks, watercourses, and sewers, the last of which had clearly raised Mira's frustrations. Hackles into my carefully concealed amusement. I didn't bother to call her on it. Despite my fears, her illuminator didn't seem to have attracted any unwanted attention, 
which contrary to what you might expect, did nothing to relieve my tension I was feeling. The longer we remained undiscovered, the more I became certain that we were surely about to be, and I found myself listening out for any trace of sound which might betray ambushers, lurkers ahead of us in the darkness. I heard plenty, of course, but instinct and experience enabled me to identify most of the noises almost at once, and discount them as any kind of threat. Most common was the scuttling of vermin, running for cover at the approach of light and noise, but occasionally the scuffling was louder, indicating a human presence. Invulnerably, these would be fleeing too. However, rather than advancing to contact, which meant they were civilians, with an understandably cautious attitude to men with guns, whether they were artisans, trying to keep the fractured infrastructure of the city from falling apart completely, or merely the lackless disposed, academic of large-scale civil disorder, despite the fearful enough or to attempt to find some kind of refuge down here. I had no idea. They went shooting at us, and that was all that mattered to me. We're here, Mira said at last. I checked my chronograph, wondering what sort of progress Grease and this squad were making. From what I'd seen of them, I've had laid pretty fair odds that they'd reach our, their objective by now, and were making short work of it. Once again, I found myself reaching for the combead, which would normally have been sitting in my ear, and rooting its absence. It had, of course, occurred to me to scourge one, from the command bunker, but such refinements appeared to be lacking among the Viridian PDF. The best they could offer me was a bulky portable Voxcaster, which was currently bouncing along the back of its operator. Stopping to use the thing, taking up time, we can ill afford, however. So I do resign myself from remaining out of contact for a while, and trying to ignore my misgivings as best as I could. Good, I responded, superstitiously, checking my slate to see where here actually was. It turned out to be a sewer, running directly under the Pizzaia the rebels had decided to use as an artillery park, and I began to get the first inkling of a battle plan. A little late for that, you may be thinking, and you'd probably be right. I'd been bounced into fool's errands by circumstance, not choice, and I hadn't find much of a chance to think about anything beyond the most intermediate concern of ensuring my own survival. I beckoned the Vox man forward and he came to join me, unclipping the bulky headset as he did so. Came to Adeptus Astartes, I said, praying to the Emperor that the frequency I'd been given was correct and keeping it short in case we are being monitored. In position. Query yours. Engaging. Grease responded to my relief. Resistance, light. The Thunderhawk will commence derisionary attacks in two minutes. Thank you, I replied, taking in a single squad of troopers accompanying me and the distinctly unmarial figure of Mira, who was listening intently but who, for once, seemed able to resist the temptation to shove her over in thank of the Emperor. We're going to need all the help we can get. Leave this channel open, Grease said, then cut the link at his end. What did he mean by that? Mira demanded, as if I knew the answer and was mercilessly withholding it out of pike. I shrugged. Probably wants the accurate position to fix the Thunderhawk so we don't end up on the wrong end of some friendly fire. I haphazardly considered the amount of coordinated lethality with the gunship represented. It seemed a reasonable and precision precaution to me. I turned to the sergeant in charge of the squad, whose name I didn't know. Mira hadn't bothered which introductions, if she'd been considered the men under her no male command as individuals in the first place. We need to get up top and find out exactly where the artillery pieces are. With a bit of luck, we can use the demo charges to collapse this tunnel underneath them and cripple the battery without having to fight our way through the sentries. 
if they're parked close enough to it, the sergeant agreed, honing in on the weak spot of the plan without undermining my authority by actually stating it, like in effect, nonicums. I've been doing since humanity first swung down from the trees in holy terror and started hitting one another with rocks. Let's hope they are, I said. Or well, we'll just have to do this the old hard-fashioned way. By the time the twelfth Vihalin, I knew that each artillery piece would probably be fully crewed, plus a few centuries. Logical support, personnel, and a handful of junior officers and non-coms to make sure the conscripts shove the shells in the breach just right. Given that we already knew from the orbital picks that there were five basculists in the battery, that meant anything from 30 to 50 men although I'd be happy enough taking the odds of three or five to one against mere PDF mutineers with proper guardsmen behind me. The troops I had now were probably little better in quality than the ones we were facing, and that was without taking Mira into account, who was probably worth an extra squad to the enemy just on her own. Well, there's only one way to find out, she said, starting up the ladder and leading to the manhole cover behind above our heads before i could stop her having already seen enough to know the reprimanding her would be pointless and shooting her would be out of the question close enough to the enemy for an alert sentry to hear i just have to go along with it for now wait here i instructed the sergeant who seemed more than happy to comply check the charges while i'm gone there was no point in having the whole squad blundering about up there when I was sure Mira could attract the attention of the enemy perfectly well on her own. I could hardly leave her to her own devices. However, so I clambered up after her, having waited a moment to make sure that her emergence into daylight wouldn't be followed at once by barrage or lasgun fire. It wasn't, so I stuck my head out cautiously out of the hall, finding myself in a street which looked much for the worse for wear. The buildings on either side of it were pockmarked with, perforated by prolonged and indiscriminate use of heavy ordnance, while the carriageway a few meters ahead had been comprehensively blocked to traffic by the resulting bulk of the burnt-out chimera. Taking advantage of the cover it offered, I popped up over the hole, like a slumbrat, stretching for fresh corpse, and scuttled into the lee of a derelict vehicle. Where are the others? Mira asked, from roughly the level of my knees, having gone prone under the raised dozer blade of the extra protection, the first sensible thing I'd ever seen her do. Her last gun was unslung and aimed back at the manhole, evidently intended to cover my advance and I breathed the silent prayer of thanks to the golden throne that she hadn't been spooked enough to pull the trigger. Down in the hole, I said quietly. I told him to stay put. You did what? She stood up and glared at me with an effect, somewhat spoiled by the thick coating of grime now, adhering to her jacket and the knees of her trousers. At least she blended into the background a little bit better now, which was something. We need them with us. Did you ever go stalking in those haunting trips of yours? I asked Mira nod. Mira nodded solemnly. Of course, she said, having the common sense to keep her voice down too, which was a welcome surprise. And did you have a demi score of troopers crushing around the place while you did? I asked reasonably. Mira shook her head dismissively. Of course not. It would have frightened the game away. Then the coin dropped. I see. Of course. We're going to need to move quietly. I shook my head. I'm going to need to move quietly, I said. You stay here in case I need covering fire. I'd be the first to admit that taking the risk of scouting the enemy positions myself, instead of letting Mira get it on with, seems a little uncharacteristic. But I had sound enough reasons at the time. 
Personally, I had more than enough practice at sneaking around in the immediate vicinity of the enemy without being spotted. Whereas Mira alleged stalking with skills were unknown quantity. Secondly, thanks to my time with the 12th Valhallen, I knew enough about artillery to access how big of a threat the battery really was. Once I got a decent look at it, as well, most of the useful thing Mira would likely to report was that the basilisks were a horribly unfashionable color. Thirdly, thanks to my innate affinity for underground environments, I'd know intensively, just by looking, how close they were to our sewer line, and where the best place to put the charge is to cause the maximum amount of subsidence. For a moment, it looked as though Mira was about to argue the point, but before she can get a chance, the circling Thunderhawk pilot decided to provide a diversion Grease had promised me. Whatever she'd been going to say was abruptly swallowed by the muffled clump of a distant detonation, and a plume of smoke nudged its way over the artificial horizon of the buildings surrounding us, followed by a moment later by a faint tremor through the soles of my boots. It seemed he found the ammunition dump, or something equally combustible at any rate. It was a pretty safe bet that the attention the rebels had been effectively gambled. Taking advantage of the moment, I made a run for the nearest building, which seemed so securely unsound. Despite the number of holes plastered through its outer walls, it had evidently been the emporium of some kind. But what it's used to sell, and I could only guess, as the looters had been here long before me and gutted the place. Entering through the long, wide gap where the window used to be, my feet crunching and slithering for a moment on shattered glass, I made for the shadows of a rear of the shop. Whereas in the tunnel, my somber uniform would allow me to blend in more easily. Luck, or the Emperor, was with me, and I found a staircase just the other side of the wooden door, which had been kicked or rammed off its hinges. There was an elevator, too, but I wouldn't have taken it, even if it was the power was still on. The idea of being discovered by the enemy trapped in a small metal box was disturbing, to say the least. I took the stairs easily five or six flights before the chill rot assisted my progress, and I ventured out into what had evidently been one of the upper-scale floors. Indeed, it seemed out of, in respect of the number of stories the Emporium used to boast. This was now as high as the possible could go. The ceiling was down across half the floor area, along with a sufficient rubble to make the certain that whatever might remain in the original structure higher up, it was extremely unlikely to be able to bear my weight. This story was high enough for my purposes, though his quick glance was enough to assure me the far wall was missing and the floor coming to an abrupt end about a meter from where it should be, offering a panoramic view across which uh, much of the city. I made for it cautiously, testing every footfall, but it all seemed solid enough, and within a minute or two I was close enough to the edge to look down into the rebels' artillery park, across the rubbled remains of the intervening buildings on the other side of the street. This had evidently far, fared far worse than the one I was occupying, though. A few floors still remained and had been reduced to about half the height of a scattered structure I was currently standing in. The most courtesy of the Gleasons was enough to tell me that my plan to collapse the sewer wouldn't cut it. Only one of the artillery pieces was in the right place to be disabled, the rest being dispersed around the square, backed into remains of buildings or concealment and protection and surrounded by sandbagged emplacements, no chance of being able to run up and place a satchel charge either. We'd be cut down before we even got a close. As the wind shifted, it brought with it a grumble of idling engines and an arid tang of burned Prometheum. It had been right about them being prepared to scatter if the Thunderhawk moved in their direction too. Perhaps if we mined the roads with demo charges we brought with us, we could bottle them up along with the gunship to take them out, but our chances of being able to place the explosives in the open without being spotted were minimal. I was musing over the problem when a lasbolt hit past me. 
impacting against the stump of one of the columns which used to support the floor above. I turned, drawing my weapons, and cursing myself for a fool. The very reason I'd chosen this spot was to scout the enemy emplacements from also made it the perfect place to station sentries. And I should have anticipated an enemy presence here. Two men were running at me, las guns in their hands and firing as they came. But fortunately, it's almost impossible to shoot accurately while on the move. They had the sense to stand still and aim probably. They'd probably have dropped me before I even became aware of the presence. Unfortunately for them, I wasn't so stupid. Only taken a couple of strides to find refuge behind a sturdy pillar, which had already stopped one of the las bolts before dropping to a crouch and cracking off a couple rounds of my own. My aim was scarcely any better at first, but one of the last bolts from my pistol clipping the edge of the right-hand man's torso armor. But it wasn't enough to make him hesitate as he looked around for some cover. I saved him the bother, putting a third and last harried shot through the middle of his face, and he went down hard. Beyond the usual reflective spasms, I didn't move again which left the second man, who was going wide across towards the drop, hoping to flank me. And he got shot in the round with a ricochet pillar, or the rockade pillar I was sheltering behind. I dodged back, trying to target him around the other side, but with belated surge of common sense, he switched to full auto, hoisting my makeshift position down with a blizzard of fire too heavy for me to be able to risk popping out to take a crack at him. Abruptly, the firing ceased, and I seized the opportunity to momentarily lull presented, looking out to the side as I stood, my chainsaw swinging to meet an anticipated charge, while my last pistol sought the target. To my surprise, however, he was already down, flat out on the rubble-strewn floor, deader than Horus. I approached the corpse weirdly, anticipating some kind of trick, but as I got closer, I could see that the back of his head was missing. Taken out by the last bolt from the angle of the wound, it had clearly come from somewhere down below, outside the building. I edged cautiously to the brink of the drop and glanced down. Mira still crouched in lee of the burned-out chimera, the last gun raised and pointing in my direction. Seeing me, she lowered the weapon and waved, in a manner which, even in that distance, struck me as distinctly pleased with herself. Hard to resent that under the circumstances, though. So I returned the wave and turned back to the bodies of the late sentries. Neither had any Vox gear on them, or anything else that might have provided some useful intelligence to come to that. So I started to head back towards the stairs, intent on nothing more than going back down the hole and out of sight before anyone got around to missing them. I barely got to a pace or two, though, before the air seemed to thicken around me and the hairs on my arms bristling as if a thunderstorm was building. A remarkably unpleasant sensation of pressure began to grow behind my eyes and I felt as if my sinuses were being packed with rockrete. And I stumbled, my vision blurring. Then, as suddenly as it began, the feeling ended, leaving me almost giddy with relief. I hurried back to the hole in the wall, looking outside anxiously just as a rubble of Displaced air echoed between the buildings, like one of the distant explosions where the crew of the Thunderhawk were continuing to amuse themselves. The Rebel Artillery Park was in a state of complete confusion, with people running everywhere like rats in a room when someone turns the lights on. And as the firing started, I began to see why. Towering figures in white and yellow armor were plodding hurriedly through the pandemonium. Shrugging off the last bolt and occasional grenade, sleeting in their direction, with magnificent disdain. They were larger and bulkier than the space marines I'd seen before, although I was to become familiar with it later. This was the first time I've ever seen Terminator armor in action, apart from a handful of seconds aboard the Necron vessel before losing consciousness. Most of the space marines wearing it seemed to carry twin-barreled bolters, which put out staggering amount of firepower, dripping all traces of resistance to shreds, ripping all traces of resistance to shreds with contemptuous ease. And one had a pair of missile pods mounted above his shoulders. 
as I watched the Terminators fired one from each, taking out a basilisk which had started to move away in the explosion which knocked many of its defenders from their feet, but left the Astarte striding grimly forwards, and apparently unmoved. Another of his fellows approached the nearest artillery piece and began literally tearing it apart, the long metal claws attached to his gauntlet sheering through the thick metal as it was no more substantial than mist in the shadows, a faint nimbus of arcane injures crackling about them. Panic-stricken crewmen bailed from it and ran in random directions, desperate to get away before those formidable talons found persons in flesh. Turning my eyes reluctantly away from the spectacle because it's not often I got so close to a battle without someone diverting my attention by trying to kill me. I glanced down to make sure Mira was all right, and as it happened, she was looking distinctly apprehensive. And who could blame her? Apart from disconcerting effect of being caught in the fringes of a teleport field, she'd be hearing all the noise without a clue as to what was going on. Catching her eye, I waved as nonchalantly as I could and started back down the stairs to reassure her. After all, a knowing brat or not, she had just saved my life, which was always welcome. And she was considerably more decorative than Jürgen, whose job that usually was. What's going on? she demanded the minute I came within earshot. The space marines are taking out the artillery for us, I told her, trying not to sound too pleased about it. That headache a few minutes ago was a bunch of Terminators teleporting in, which seemed a bit like overkill given the combat squad of ordinary Dipta Astartes could have taken out rebels without breaking a sweat. But only the Terminators had the training and experience to deploy a teleporter. The thought struck me, and I nodded in sudden understanding. No wonder Gris wanted the Vox link to kept open. They must have used it as a homing beacon. Then... We were to get the men up here, she said, turning towards the manhole we just emerged from. The space marines might need some backup. I doubt it, I said, keeping the relief in my voice with an effort. It could have been the bulk of an intervening building, but it sounded to me like the firing was already reducing in both intensity and volume. But you're right about getting back under cover as fast as we can. If we could read the situation right, the few remaining rebels would give up trying to make a fight of it and start fleeing for their lives at any moment now. And what would be a bad time to get caught in the open? I fully expected Mira to argue about that, as she seemed to do more or less by reflex every time I tried to give her to get her to be sensible. But if she was about who, she never got the chance. Instead, she crouched behind the wrecked Khmer and raised her last gun. Too late, she said. All right, I hope you enjoyed this little thing of Kaifus Kane. It was it's a quite long video compared to the other ones I've done, and I hope you like and subscribe. Leave a comment if you want to see another book being read or whatever. If there's something you want to see done for the Patreon that I'm working on. I'm working on the tiers right now to get things set up and going. One of them is going to be like a $5 thing where it's like you can request a book to be read. And there's going to be another one where it's a little bit higher where you get to choose um, like different roles or different types of roles I get to do or, or whatever. I'm still working on it. A lot of it is just thinking things out because I can't really change things up after I set things up because I, I'm going to be, I'm lazy. I'm a lazy bastard. I really am. I'm just going to set it and go, all right, I'm done. I'm not going to do it anymore. I, of course, I'm going to have a $1 tier where I just say your name at the end of the video and then a $5 one where you're like a very special person on that. And then $10, of course, being the book one. I, I said that twice already. Shoot. Oh, well, maybe a $50 one where I put a drawing of you or your character or whatever um, in the background of the video at the end of it instead of the little things that I have constantly going, which are just these little tiny things that are in the background that you see now and then, such as a drawing I've done or something else someone else has done 
overlapping maybe some bloopers or something. So that way you can have something funny to listen to while seeing drawing of your character or anything else. But that is to be determined later. I also do uh, commission work for drawings, which is going to be in my Twitter, which is um, going to be down below in the description. So there's that. If you want to have any work done by me, such as drawings or any type of Photoshop job, uh, work done as well, I do that as well. Um, just shoot me up and I'll do a PM or something. And we can just discuss things from there. I take um, PayPal and Venmo. Anyways, I've been me, you've been you, and I hope you enjoyed this video. See you again next time. Bye-bye. And now for some bloopers. Fuck, I, f I lost my place. God damn it. What the fuck is wrong with me? I am Grease, Adeptus Astartes, fighting against the resistance. Ha! He! Who! Kaifus Kane, ready and reporting for duty. I kind of shit myself a little bit on the approach, but no one knows that I'm, I'm sweating here. Oh my god. <laughs> I checked my crotchograph. <laughs> oh god. Okay, one more time.